Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. This event is called Love is a Ghost and we are so excited to bring Laurel Fantuzo and Hosanna Asuncion to the stage where they will be reading from their debut works. Following the reading will be a conversation between the authors facilitated by audience Q&A. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Laurel. Uh, Laurel Fantuzo was born in Southern California to a Filipina mother and an Italian American father. Um, she is the author of the nonfiction book, The First Impulse, published by Anvil Publishing in 2016. Louise Francia writes that the book will cause you to ponder and appreciate the inter interrogatory restlessness and intelligence of those belonging, whose belonging is simultaneously claimed and disavowed by multiple worlds. The recipient of grants and residencies from er Erasmus, Fulbright, and Hedgebrook, Laurel teaches at Yale, Yale NUS College and lives between Singapore and Quezon City, Philippines. Please welcome Laurel to the stage. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much to the workshop for having us. Um, when I was living in the city from 2006 to 2010, um, the workshop helped me become a nonfiction writer. And um, Hosanna Sincion has always been a really inspiring artist and friend who I met here. So it's wonderful to come home here with her as a fellow author. So the first page of my nonfiction book, The First Impulse, is a news article from September 2009 that sets out what the book is about. So I'll read the news article first. Four suspects are wanted in the slaying of a Filipino-Canadian and his Slovenian girlfriend, both film critics, who were shot dead in the home they shared in suburban Manila. Alexis Chaseco, 28, and his 29-year-old girlfriend, Nika Bohink, were killed late Tuesday in what police believe was a botched robbery at their home in Kazan City. It is believed that the robbery was an inside job involving a maid who worked for the couple. Chaseco and Bohink showed up after the robbery began and were shot. Chaseco and Bohink met at a film festival in the Netherlands about two years ago. So that's how the book begins. And today I'll read a uh, an excerpt from a chapter called What Happened. And was anyone here for Susan Kimpo's reading a few months ago? Yeah, so she's a, um, a Filipina author who wrote about her family's experience with martial law. And she's actually a character in this chapter. And um, the only thing you know, need to know is that at this point in the book, I had a dream about Nika. So Susan arranged a prayer ritual at the house where the couple died. Um, and then after that, we'll show a short six-minute film, and um, you can sort of see visually more of the story yourselves. I was the first person to arrive at the prayer ritual at Alexis and Nika's old house at 39 Times Street on the two-year anniversary of the murders. It was a rainy afternoon. Cars sped by using Times Street as a traffic shortcut from the more congested parallel Kazan Avenue and the intersecting highway pivotal to Philippine history, EDSA. I rang the bell. An older maid opened the barred green gate for me. This was Manang. She was 59 years old now, and she still tended the house. She still lived in the room where the intruders hogtied and gagged her before they waited for her young boss, Alexis, to return home with Nika. Friend of Alexis, Manang asked in English. She did not invite me in right away. I never see you. You don't watch movies here. Pasensya na po, I try. Estudiante ako, Philam. Sorry, ma'am, I'm just a Philam student. Ah, she brightened. Magaling ang Tagalog mo. Si Nika, hindi niya mentindihan. Your language skills are good. Nika didn't understand it. The floor in the living room was cold white tile. The ceiling was low. The air was too close somehow, even with the windows open. The outline of Alexis and Nika's taken down frames and movie posters were still imprinted on the old white walls. Manang pointed out a small, jagged gray nick in the kitchen floor, a bullet mark. She waved her arms, body length, in front of the refrigerator. Alexis, here. She gestured across from the refrigerator to the kitchen wall two feet away. There was a low table covered with an orange cloth and candles. An open magazine showed Nika's portrait. She rested one finger on her face, like the editor she was, smiling sideways at someone through her glasses. Nika, there, Manang said pointing at the floor beneath the table. I nodded. Manang was pointing at the murder scene. I left the kitchen quickly. Ate Susan arrived with a pale Filipina woman and moved into the kitchen. The woman stopped and looked at me. I'm Alexis's Aunt Tina. Susan tells me you had a dream about Nika. I feel a sudden sense of shame and intrusion. This, after all, 
was the relative who identified their bodies at the murder scene. I'm so sorry, I said. I really didn't mean to. It's hard for me too, Tina said. Her voice was searching and gentle. I was worried that Alexis's family in Canada wouldn't agree to this because they're from the West. They might not understand. But they told me anything for Nika. Tina paused. I was so sad when I heard Nika hadn't moved on. How can you not move on? I had no answer. Ate Susan smiled and scolded me. Where's your orange? Orange is the color for moving on. You must wear orange. I don't have any orange, I said. Sigue here, Ate Susan said, and handed me an orange shawl. I wrapped it around my neck. Erwin Romulo, Alexis's best friend and editor, entered the front door. He wore a sharp, dark business suit and blue sneakers. I felt newly panicked and guilty for encroaching into this tragedy when I saw Erwin. I began to sweat, wrapped as I was in orange. But Erwin greeted me. He remembered my name. He showed his phone to me. I've gotten so many weird messages since Alexis died. Everyone around this time of the year starts texting, calling, people telling me, try this, did you do that, was it this person? Well, we tried that, we did that, we don't know if it was this person. And then, last night, I got a text. It said Alexis had moved on, but Nika hadn't. Her spirit is restless here in the house. I didn't recognize the number. What the fuck am I supposed to do with that? How does that help me? He looked for my agreement from behind his glasses. His eyes were red. I nodded. It didn't help him. More of Alexis and Nika's friends arrived. A film critic a filmmaker, neighbors. They watched as Manang arranged chairs in a semicircle, facing the place where Nika died. Some were amused and impatient. Others were earnest. I wondered which I should be. Ate Susan sat next to the table with Nika's photograph on it. Magandang hapon ho, Ate Susan began. I'm sure many of you have been to memorials here in the house since September 1, 2009, but we're here today to focus especially on Nika. I could sense here in the kitchen that Alexis had moved on to the next world, but Nika's spirit is still here. We're here because we care about her, and we'd like to help her proceed to her next stage, her next life. We'll start with some remembrances. For the ritual to be effective, please focus on happy memories of Nika, nothing too sad. We'll start with Erwin. The muscles in Erwin's face jumped with anger. I could see him fighting physically to keep his courtesy. He would say later that this was the most offensive intrusion into his grief that he'd ever endured, but for now, he kept his voice level. I can't believe that Alexis would leave Nika behind. That's totally unlike him. Did you know Nika? Ate Susan asked. I didn't know her as well as I knew Alexis, but I know he loved her. He was so worried because she was supposed to leave on September 3 to return to Slovenia. Why was he worried? Ate Susan asked. Because he loved her, Erwin cried. He was going to miss her. Erwin looked down, struggling. He cleared his throat and tried to end the audience's focus on his indignation. If, if he did leave her behind, Alexis, Alexis, call her home, man. He fell silent. Do you have any memories of Nika? Auntie Susan asked. I, I spent time with Nika just once. She was upstairs here. Alexis turned on an 11-hour movie by Lav Diaz. Nika came downstairs. She was so annoyed. I don't know why he wants to watch this 11-hour movie again, she said. She went outside to smoke. Alexis didn't smoke. Erwin paused. I never spoke to Alexis about his relationships. Movies lang. Ate Susan nodded and thanked Erwin. He looked at his shoes. She moved around the circle. Their other friends spoke, talking about their meetings and vacations with Alexis and Nika, their work in film criticism. Nika once met Imelda Marcos and mocked the gaudy paintings the dictator's widow kept. Alexis refused to meet Imelda out of principle, but Nika was curious. Once, Nika leapt up at a film screening at University of the Philippines and confronted a Filipino man rustling a chip bag. Excuse me, Nika hissed. Could you stop that? And the man did stop. It was startling to hear flashes of Nika during her life. Through stories, it did not feel as if she were completely gone. Ate Susan instructed us to light incense and walk around. We have to bring movement into the house, she said. Everything here is too still, too suffocating. She instructed us in a dance, undulating her arms to demonstrate. Erwin moved his limbs obediently. I tried too. Then Erwin shook his head and gave up. He walked upstairs. I followed him. Nika's black chair was still in her office. So were some postcards of director's portraits she and Nika had taped up behind her desk. Lav Diaz. Cavan de la Cruz. Erwin sat in Nika's former chair and looked at the opposite wall. We used to watch movies here, Erwin said. Yeah. 
He gazed at the wall as if something were playing there now. I moved away, giving him a moment alone. In the next room, I stopped and looked at the windows. This was my first time in this room, but I'd seen these windows before. They were wide windows set with horizontal metal bars. Nika showed them to me in my dream. I rushed to the downstairs bathroom and bent at the waist, feeling a sudden shocked cramp. I waited there until the pain passed. I didn't know how to explain this moment of recognition. I wanted to deny it, so I said nothing. But I couldn't deny it. A week after the prayer ritual, when she was alone in her office, Ate Susan said she heard a young man and woman laughing. Ate Susan discerned this. Alexis had been waiting for Nika on a higher plane. He never really left her. He had been waiting for her to make the choice to move forward. Now they were reunited, and Nika could continue on her journey. And what can I conclude? I can only echo Detective Maharas in Alexis's favorite film, Batang West Side. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But if there was something to it, if Nika lingered in the house in the Philippines after her murder, remaining in restless, outraged disbelief, knowing with full consciousness that she deserved to be alive in her own country, not dead, forever separated from her, her homeland in the hazardous place Alexis chose to love, I don't know. Despite everything, I loved the Philippines. I loved its warm welcome, its dialogue with spirits, its traffic and motion in the heat and danger of its past and present. But sometimes I, too, grew angry and paralyzed at everything about my mother's country I could neither repair nor understand. Nika, had it been me, I might have lingered in outrage, too. It isn't about people of the masses not knowing these, their works today, but it's about the reason why some people might not get to see them. And that that's pertaining to how we take care of our arts. And I was so um, overwhelmed by the film that I was unable to, to speak when I went out of the cinema for, I don't know, for quite a while. Uh, I would say that that's the time when I discovered it. crítico cinematográfico e impulsor del nuevo cine filipino Alexis Tioseco. Al poco de instalarse allí les asesinaron en su propio apartamento cuando regresaban de una cena en lo que parece ser un caso de delincuencia común, uno de tantos en un país complicado. Fue la noche del martes 1 de septiembre pasado. Dito ah, lalo na pag nag-iisa ka, maraming mandurukot.
Otročia som. Nisi. Daj, moram napraviť. Ostani tu. High school to a bigger town. Um, going to cinema became a regular practice every weekend, Fridays, Saturdays were reserved for cinema. <laughs> when we talk about uh, the films of Lino Broca, Ismail Bernal, or even the recently named national artist Manuel Conde, I don't think we talk about them as elitist filmmakers. Uh, so I think it's a bit wrong to have that um, impression. And we add to that, to those names, Jerry De Leon and Lamberto Avellana. Um, and I think the perspective, the more important perspective, wouldn't be that these are elitist, but it would be to say that these are ones that we feel are important and that we feel more people should watch. <laughs> Lima, Anim, Ito, Walo, Sham, Sampo. Tomorrow, when I reclaim the ancient curse from my ancestors, wear the same heavy mask of silence. You will fill the vacancies like minor clues to a mystery. Anywhere in this blind city, without caution, anyone may notice the deliverance of those who never believe the lie you spread. Hosanna Asuncion grew up near the 105 and the 710 freeway in Los Angeles and currently lives near an AC stop in Brooklyn. A Kundiman Fellow who has been published by the Poetry Society of America, The Collagist, and Tuesday, an art project, Anti. She is the author of the 2016 poetry collection, Object Permanence, from Magic Helicopter Press. Chiwan Choi writes, the poem in Object Permanence took me back to places I thought I didn't want to return. Streets and nights and bars and beds, to lovers and death and longing, to loneliness and moments where I thought I was losing grasp of life. 
But somewhere, sometime, in between the first and final brutally gorgeous piece, I learned to cherish my pain again. Please welcome Hosanna to the stage. It's so nice not to have to move the mic down. Uh, thank you to the workshop for having. <laughs> thank you to the workshop. Yes. And um, it's always been, uh, I've always really wanted to read with Darren Chris. Um, Laurel's writing astounds me for how brave she is and how she interrogates and investigates um, and also how she doesn't lose her humanity um, when facing very difficult things to write about. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, okay, now it's sex phones. It's hard to Okay. A. Why didn't you tell me about the fire in the kitchen? B. I wanted you to fail. 1425 Broadway, apartment 3R. After sex, the comedian starts to talk about an Asian woman he had slept with. He looks at me. I wasn't lying to you when I said I hadn't had sex with an Asian woman. I wasn't lying then. He then starts to sing The Confrontation from Les Miserables. When I try to play one of the parts he sings over me, the creepiness crept in quickly. <laughs> I was alone, he was alone, we were together in bed, together by proximity, much like strangers in a subway car, and also very much self-contained in an isolated, isolated sail, cell of an animated beehive. He was a very good Javert. He was really tapping into some inner duality. <laughs> he was Javert, righteous, without character, and Valjean, tortured and anti-heroic. But it felt lonely being outside of a duet, all the while without panties. <laughs> I start to think about what I need to clean in the kitchen and how I need to get up early tomorrow. I start to think about Marjorie Elliott and how I've wanted to go to her Sunday jazz parlors. I thought of Blossom Deary and how I missed seeing her at the skylight before she died. He looks over at me. Where are you? Did you leave? You know, you're the most intelligent woman I've gone out with, he said. He gets up and starts walking around my room. And I've gone, a lot, I've gone out with a lot of smart women. And he picks up the phrenology bust on my bookshelf and stares at it, considers the weight of it in his, in his hand. Knock, knock, I say. Who's there, he asks. Anticipation, I say. He says, anticipation who? A, the rip in my dress is getting bigger. B, what is trying to escape? 125 Oak Street. Let's say I don't recognize myself. Let's say that watching myself have sex is the first time I'm looking at my image and not looking for a way to say, you are beautiful. And let's say that is a beautiful thing. So I watch it again and watch it again for me. I call my mother and ask her, could you take a moment to see me? I hear a casino over the phone. She's praying again. Coincidentally, a memory turns a bold inbox. Help me remember, he writes, and he wants to remember the wrong things. Thank you for remembering me, I reply, in the way that feels like no thing I don't write. I have taken to watching the video nightly. Sometimes I just listen to it, but I see a new thing every day. Look, I say to myself, there's a sexy part, and it is sexy. It's the look on his face, which was, more often than not, too conscious of the camera he pointed to document how my body moved with his. 
His head is thrown back, and he has stopped administering these uhs I first mistook as hesitation, and is instead breathing. Breathing and breathing something real and moist. This moment is a tremor along a route between my pelvis and my rib cage. I pause the clip. I stare into it until the tremors become coming. It feels good to know how I can sound. It feels good to know the meaning of sound. The comments are poorly written with many misspellings. Though there is one that I like so much, I use it when coming isn't enough. But I should be angry. I have to borrow someone's anger to feel appropriate about this. I said, yes, you can pull my hair, you can suck hard, use teeth, you can use the word fuck when you need to say please or again. But I did not consider the consequence of others watching. I am going to teach myself to be angry about this. But first, I must stop. And yet now, all I know is how to be watched. It is how I pretend time. It is how I know north. It is the quick route to REM. In between watching myself and watching myself, I see the world has many eyes. My favorite is the man who walks his dog in the morning and carries his baby close against his chest. One day, my video is gone. My accidental revelation is disappeared. I find ways to explain this to myself. I can only rely on very sad traditions that travel along familiar curvatures. Perhaps he drowned in the dip of my hip. Perhaps the, perhaps the dip was not deep enough for anyone to find a disappearance. I have to start looking in mirrors again to remember what I look like. Why can't I climb my hair? What happened to my father's nose? Automatic doors have stopped opening for me. I can't fit any seat on the subway. I'm only leaving messages and never talking. A, it's a kiss. B, not without the trouble. Bainbridge and Howard. It's 1.38 a.m. and I'm asking of them, do you love each other? They answer this way. His lids droop when she touches him and she smiles right before he delivers a punchline. But they also feel this way. Lately, her warm hands are so hot they burn him and her smiles are waiting, waiting, waiting to unsmile. Their love has slipped tentatively and there is the growing resentment that the reason why their lives are not moving forward is, to clo is the clog of another person's brokenness. They must find new angles of loving each other's internal and external surfaces. This is why they, ha they have come to me. I know he is watching us. I'm on top of her, kissing her as she moans against my mouth with my fingers inside of her. She is luscious. I like her more than him. She likes me touching her and he likes watching us. It's all working out for now. You like her touching your pussy, baby, he asks. He's stroking my penis. My dick is so hard. He's a narrator, this one. <laughs> I lean towards the literary, and my reflex is to listen to the story, though I would rather not. And I can't help but try to revise what he is saying. But what I think could be said doesn't sound right with the cavity of his voice. Perhaps there is only pornography in this moment if no other language can exist to describe it. Say how much you like her fucking your pussy, he says. She feels so good, she says, and starts to make a condensation of sounds because she is right now steam. There is nothing about her that is dry. She is slippery, and I realize there is no way to hold on to her. I look at him, and I can see on his face he wants to hold on to her, too. But I am unsure if it's about possession or because there's a tickling weight in his belly that is jealousy and is quickly growing to such an expanse. I can almost taste the Atlantic Ocean separating us in this bed. I am pushing my fingers inside her, curling my fingers just so, and I am drawing question marks, asking her, do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love him? He wants to know, too. He strokes his hand to brush the hair from her face and raises her head to kiss him. 
I bring my mouth down to her and I quickly find that spot just on the left side of her clit and her body is tensing because it is so close to that moment. He's angry at her and so he is taking it out on me, squeezing me, smacking me, tugging at me to get to her. Yeah, he says, his voice becoming directive and reaching for a way to be part of us. Eat that pussy out. She starts to feel foreign against my mouth and face. I am drowning in that deep part of my head and I'm pushing hard against a wall that holds the indistinguishable shapes of memories. I'm part of the wall and I can't breathe and I can't remember and I can't make her come. I want to watch him fuck you, I say. And this is why I am here, to watch how the absurdity of one person and the ridiculousness of another find a way to fit with each other's corrugated outcomes. They are side by side, two splintered disagreements, agreeing not to break each other. How do you do it, I ask? But my lips are forming phonetics against skin so they don't understand my language. How can you stand to be seen so closely, I articulate, tapping my tongue against the roof of her mouth instead of mine. I try to ask them with my eyes, how can you stand that heat? Why aren't you burning? How are your scars not on fire? I am saying all these things, but they only understand me when I say, make her come, fuck her until she comes hard. She is laying a back against him and her leg is wrapped back as he plays with her clit. He is barely touching her, his hand confident feathers, and then all the darkness that was in both of them rises out of her, flushing her chest and face, and she is not just steam, more an engine. They kiss as hungry animals, and I only know to be a zookeeper. She has left the bed, and then he and I are alone with each other. Get on your knees. And then I am on my knees. His fingers are inside of me, and then I'm an animal too, making sounds like an animal. Drop your shoulders down. And then I feel these very hot hands, and she's trying to see my face. And when I can look up, she is whispering in his ear. There is nothing broken about you, he says. She has turned me around and is laying me down on the bed, grabbing the side of my hip, steadying me against him. She kisses his cheek and says something to him again. Make us something you want. He says so softly and direct, and I feel like the only way to answer is to leave. So then I'm above all of us, and I'm watching my body melt, as if I know to be sultry, and it's better to keep drifting above, waiting for the heat to rise to reach me, as it is the science of heat to do so. A. Where are these seeds from? B. A place like stirring. 26 Mon Monroe Street, Buzzer 6. While I am in the woods, severe with language and my mortality, she will be in my bedroom, in my bed, fucking her boyfriend. These are natural exchanges in New York places, the currency we use to be ways unregular in our lives, vacating our eyes while another temporarily stations a coating of, of injection. Perhaps we are artists, perhaps. Perhaps we are bored of life, of self. Perhaps her name is Constance, and she is very, ve very flexible in body and mind because she is a teacher of yoga. Maybe it is not just my bed they will use to support their fucking because she asked about the stability of my bookshelves. <laughs> to which I replied, bolted and steady an ex-carpenter, a dream ideal, love of my life sort, the kind that leaves a punishing memory for dreaming him away, built and gifted to me such a steadiness for the pages and pages of words both hard of bound and soft of spine. Bolted, she asked, to the ceiling, to the wall. He used a tool that sees inside where the wall is most reliable. Imagine such a tool to locate past plaster skin into brownstone anatomy, a place that makes the most sense for such a structure that could hold all my beloved books, present and future, and I Im imagined her boyfriend, whom I did not meet, with a face despite my most virile truth pretends of my ex-carpenter dream. 
And it is this face while I'm alone in the woody coldness of dark inspiration that is holding the remainder of her density. As they negotiate a beat, may be simple, or what stirs my envy even more, a very complicated rhythm, most likely un-American in tempo and gesture, one my body could never discern, so conditioned to one and two and three and four. In two months, I will return from the woods, my eyes squinting at the neon ambition of my city life and another's bedroom built around my bed. Tell me what you have seen, I will ask these poor books. Give me a portrait of their sex. Was it Bendy? Was it French Circus? Tell me what about their boundaries. Tell me the detailed erasures of them. What was the mode of disappearing? Policed barricades of long dark blocks more shadow than camouflage? Or a competitive color of contrast to render everything but their magic invisible? The book answer, the books answered. The sex was other material, they say, destructive of forests and roasting of flesh. Your, ba your bed, we are sad to say, will struggle to aspire. But the books were calibrated and taught with taunt. Liars, I write in their margins, and I crease their pages unnecessarily. They respond. We are ageless despite our pulpy disintegration. We are imagination, like your imagined heartache, a vapor and ombre, not grayscale gradation, but the way grass can go from alive to straw, the way we feed straw to horses or cows named Beulah, the way there's a way to be alive in the woods when the woody soil is aching for your fertilizer, the way there's a desire for your destruction, the way we like to watch beautiful little girls tumble with their firm breasts, but with such violence, our necks break from leering. Or ageless boys dying alone in the deepest loneliness of a reluctant yes. The books are wise, and then there is a screen, a glass of wine, a note to self. A. Then I'm a ghost too. B. Thank you. Now we will open it up to conversation and question and answer with the audience. Um, there will be someone who will be passing a mic to come around, so please wait for that microphone. The audio feeds into our uh, video footage. So. <laughs> yes. Okay, oh, there's a mic. Did you? I want to know, given um, uh, the, I just want to know the reception so far, especially um, with the current regime in the Philippines of the novel. I mean, how, have there been any connections that people have made with, oh, with, uh, sorry, the, with, uh, with your book and um, the current Dispensation? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, the reception has been, um, has been good um, so far. Um, I mean, people, people Instagram it, right? They've been Instagramming and quoting it in the Philippines. Um, they've been like posting it on Facebook and, and talking about how it's, and it was sort of my intention that it's one, um, particular murderous tragedy um, that speaks to the country, that speaks to the justice system, that has its own galaxy, its own universe. And so when people read it, they realize that all of the murders that they've been hearing about um, have the, the depth of this grief in a really individual way. Um, so that's been, um, I guess, I mean, it's sad to see, but also I'm, I'm glad people are making those connections, even th though this did happen in 2009, um, it's still sadly pretty um, urgent and contemporary. Um, I guess as far as for me, um, we, we don't think it was connected, but 
Four days after the book launch in the Philippines, um, someone tried to break into my house at 6 a.m. on a weekday. And um, the, we called the police because my friends were in the house and they said um, there was no crime, so we're not going to investigate. You know, so uh, we moved out of that house um, really fast. So, you know, all of the dangers I talk about in 2009, they're, they're still very old. They're still very connection to connected to martial law. And, and now, I mean, it's, it's gotten so much more um, raw and widespread, you know, the, the effect of, of this kind of violence. And then the, survivor, the survival mechanisms and, you know, the talk of ghosts to cope, um, that, that's ongoing, you know. Yeah. Does that sort of? question yeah hi <laughs> <laughs> um so you both uh, write about intimacy and intimate situations kind of from the perspective of a third person outsider but that is like uniquely involved in situations and I was wondering um, what uh, that entails in terms of writing style, in terms of how that gets the story moving or your poems moving. Um, what about that perspective is kind of the catalyst for the storytelling? I feel like as writers, we never escape the perspective of narrating our lives. So I think it's just a very natural way of you, I, I think it's more difficult for me to, <coughs> excuse me, write from the first person because, I mean, I'm as observing people all the time and judging, <laughs> judging, judging, judging. Yeah, for me, um, when I first started this book, I wanted it to be just third person, kind of dry journalism. And there was something actually very off-putting about that during the first reads. And... Um, you know, my, my first readers w said, it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be either like this memoir that you're trying to take over or just like a completely impersonal um, narration, you know, because I was always very self-conscious about intruding on the story rather than depicting it. Um, so I tried to find a balance in the book, you know, that the um, events that happen that I didn't personally witness are in um, third person but present tense. And then what I personally witnessed is in first pre person past tense. And so I, I tried to find a balance between the chapters that way. As far as style, if it's very intimate but complicated, I favor just pretty straightforward narrative style. Um, I think there, there's pressure in some uh, master of fine arts programs to be very lyric and really push the form itself. Um, and I sort of shy from that because I feel like what I'm writing about is already very complicated. Um, and so I, I try to write in a pretty straightforward narrative style. Hello. Um, both your work uh, does, it, there's sort of an occupying of other people's lives in it. Um, what kind of reactions have you guys gotten? Uh, like, Hosanna, how do, you, how do your partners feel about you writing about their work? And like, Laurel, um, how was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell the live stream. Um, and yeah, Laurel, like, it was, um, uh, how do you locate your place among, I mean, your, your, the scene that you read, like, talked about your discomfort of that, and could you, like, talk about that a little more? Uh, yeah, Hosanna, how do your partners feel? <laughs> yeah, <tell laughs> it's, it, it's a 70-30 thing where she says, oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's been very supportive. Um, uh, all of these were written, most of these were written before her. So when we're walking around tonight, she is not a, a, a character in these poems, and neither am I. Everyone assumes that. Everyone, yeah, it's not. We imagine things. I imagine things. Uh, well, like I said, when I was drafting um, the book, I, I really wanted to stay out of it. I didn't want to be in first person at all, um, and but the more I've worked on it, the more I realized that, that sort of revealing my position helped people connect to the story more, which is what I really wanted. Um, as far as the reception, um, Alexis's family really loves it. And um, his mom was saying that she couldn't put it down and she was really grateful for it. Um, so the siblings have been really generous and really supportive of, of the project. Um, there are some people who I could not 
get to interview me, where I asked them about, you know, six times over five years if they would be willing to talk. But once the book came out, you know, they contacted me to say how much they liked it and how glad they were that it existed. Um, in Slovenia, it was very tricky. So I could only spend about a month there. And a lot of people wouldn't talk to me or they would only talk to me after I asked three times. Um, I met um, Nika's family really briefly and, you know, they thanked me for working on it, but, you know, just never opened up. Um, but the family asked me for the book and, and also thanked me for it. Um, so, I, you know, that that's affirming, I guess, um, that, you know, I was as careful as I could be. Um, I wanted it to be perfect before it was published, but that never happens, so I'm sure there are issues with it <laughs> um, that other people can study. But uh, yeah, I've been grateful so far for the reception. Yeah. I have a question for Laurel. <laughs> um, I, I would love to hear your process in terms of dealing, um, you seem very sane. Um, so how did you sort of, um, to be able to write so deeply and emotionally about um, this story in particular, and I know that, uh, that we've talked about how this story found you in some ways. Um, so what was your process in, in terms of staying sane and not losing yourself in the story? Or maybe you did, and how did you find your way back? Yeah, I mean, there's a point in the middle of the book that I write about where I just like basically collapsed. I was like, I can't do this. Goodbye. I'm basically like talking to the ocean. You know, like, I can't, yeah, no, I, this is, yeah, I can't do this. This is too much, you know. But um, I feel like, you know, um, you start to feel a responsibility to the story. And, you know, however imperfect it is or however difficult it is, I really felt a responsibility to finish it and, and to share it uh, um, with the Philippines in particular. Um, as far as staying sane, you know, um, just all over the world I made friends. It's a weird way to make friends. But like, you know, I, I made f friends through this um, that are really meaningful, you know, artistic relationships and you know, people housed me that, you'll, you know, in the, in the acknowledgements, um, you'll, you'll see all the people who helped me. You never finish a book alone. I know, you know, I didn't understand that until I finished one, which is that you have, there's always this invisible team that is um, supporting its existence, which I'm grateful for. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, my name is Amos. I'm a former filmmaking student from NYU. So um, I immediately kind of connected to the subject matter. And um, first of all, I just want to commend you because you have a lot of guts. I don't know if people realize that, but you have to have a lot of guts to choose this topic and write a book about it. And um, the other thing is, um, this is the first time I'm becoming familiar with the subject matter. I hadn't heard of this story before, but um, I think if Alexis and Nika were alive today, they'd be speaking publicly, writing, publishing, and making films. So to see that other people are continuing on the work and that they live in the work that is continuing without them is just a beautiful tribute uh, to people who otherwise would have been producing and contributing to the arts and to the Philippines. So thank you. I don't really have a question. I was just my feedback after seeing all that. Well, thank Thanks. you, that's beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Laurel. This question's for you. <laughs> sure. um, so I, I, I kind of loosely understand um, you know, the story behind your book. And um, it's a two-part question. Um, uh, so it, it, it just seems totally baffling to me that if somebody would want to murder a film journalist or a critic, you know? And um, first question is like, maybe it's gonna give out some like spoiler alerts, but like, <laughs> who has something to gain from like killing a, like a pair of, uh, a couple of uh, film journalists? And also, what was my second question? Um, how did this affect like art criticism, film criticism, and filmmakers in the Philippines? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, first of all, I, part of what I, I look at in the book is that every possibility um, that people rumored showed you something else about the Philippines. And so, like, every, every time I go through one of the chapters, it shows you a possibility that also shows you something about the bigger context in the country. Um, I thought that I would release the book with it just being unsolved, you know. And then I talked to the publisher about the cover, 
Um, and the next day I got a text um, that they had found a suspect. And that was just last year. And so I wrote two new chapters um, after doing like a little more research on this suspect. So, um, so that's all I'll tell you as far as <laughs> spoilers, that, that, as far as the, how the book goes. And secondly, um, yeah, initially it was, it was devastating uh, because what Alexis and Nika had been doing for, as far as curation and, and essaying and organizing and criticism um, for filmmakers in the Philippines and in the region you know, and, and in Europe, um, it was tr a tremendous amount of work that, that um, left a really gaping hole for a long time. But what's been heartening to see over the past decade is that so much of what they anticipated, so many of the filmmakers and the performers and the producers that they championed have gone on to do amazing work. And there's now a film archive, which is one thing that um, Alexis and Nika really worked on. Um, Lav Diaz has you know, every accolade almost um, in the film world that, that you can have. Um, a lot of the people that they supported financially and emotionally um, through their filmmaking have, have really just gone on to do amazing work. So that's, I think that's a tribute to the work that they actually continue to do, so, yeah. Uh, this might be like a pretty obvious question to ask of you two, but if, I wondered if you could both speak to kind of the prospect of, about, of writing about sexuality and violence and those two categories not being mutually exclusive and kind of what it means for each of you to take up those topics. So with um, the poems that I read tonight, um, the impetus for them uh, was, was a, I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could write sex scenes that were poetic. Um, so that's, that was the exploration there, and of course, um, how, I mean, the gendered body comes into play, um, the, how we communicate to each other through sex. Um, that was the, one of the underlying ideas um, that I wanted to address. Um, and, uh, Watching a lot of porn for research? No, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> okay, I did. No. I did. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, I mind, uh, you know, I, uh, I've used dating apps. <laughs> so it was just mining the life that was around me at the time when I, I, I wrote these about, I don't know, eight years ago. So it was different person than very young and stupid no um for me um love's proximity to violence haunts every piece of work i do um so i, I think that's how i deal with it it's just um uh, i think every writer has questions that they try to keep answering all their lives and i think that's one paradox that I'll always try to keep answering. Hi. <laughs> um, I don't have a question, but, <laughs> but I just wanted to point out a couple of things, uh, two or three things related to Laurel's uh, book. Thanks very much for um, um, writing the book. Um, it's a lot of things have come out on in uh, magazines, newspapers. Uh, Love Diaz made a one-hour film on the story, but it's important that it come out in book form, uh, especially. Um, and I just wanted to uh, point out that, um, uh, well, uh, Alexis Joseco, um uh, made it a mission in his life to champion um, Lab Diaz, uh, Lino Broca, Ishmael Bernal, Jerry De Leon, um, Lamberto Evaliana. And actually, uh, uh, I just wanted to mention there's going to be a landmark publication. Uh, it's coming out in the Philippines uh, in September. It's, um, uh, it's called Direct. It's a collection of biographical works on these great directors, 14 of them, and uh, it, it's going to be a landmark because 
basically, Nobel's really published books on biographies of these uh, great directors from the three golden ages of cinema. And we're planning to have a book launch uh, after later in the year at the cons uh, Philippine Consulate. So check out the Philippine Consulate site. Um, in, uh, in, uh, on August 1, actually, um, at the consulate also, we're going to show the restored version of uh, one of the landmarks of Philippine cinema by Bernal. Pagdating sa dulo, it's free admission. So check out also the um, consulate, English subtitles, free refreshments. Uh, the film was just recently restored by Cinetica de Bologna. Re, uh, uh, Imagino Retrovata, which is the um, you know number one restoration outfit in in the world, and uh, the third thing I wanted to mention is that um, I guess Laurel, you, well everybody knows that the film that made Alexis uh, basically change his life and move to the Philippines is uh, seeing Batang West Side, and I just wanted to mention that. Um, one of the major actors of Batang West Side is right here. Uh, this is, uh, it's Jed. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're honored to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jed, Jed, Mar Jed Marino, who's an artist himself. Okay, great, great. Um, w yeah, I think I, re I, I definitely remember your face in that film. So <laughs> I think a very scary person in that film. <laughs> Thanks both of you so much. I have a question for Laurel. Yes. I was just wondering, like, um, so when I was like looking into the book a little bit, like, I, it's t sold as like a nonfiction book that combines memoir and all these different genres, like, including true crime. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, if you felt like, or how did you, how do you feel about like your relationship to that genre, or were there things about true crime that you like took as narrative strategies, but obviously like. The book is really good because it's not salacious. Like you're trying to make it like really politically sensitive and find the nuances and why this might have happened and why in the Philippines and why in the city. Like I'm just curious, like um, if if you felt like you had a conflicted relationship to that genre or if you didn't think about it at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, true true crime. If you look at crime reporting in the Philippines, it, it is really. Um, most of the time, it's really rushed writing. It's really, um, sen yeah, it is sensational. It is salacious. Um, it relies really heavily on really bloody, ho horrific photographs. And I feel like, um, you know, th there was a point in the book that I write about where, um, like, Alexis's family sees the crime scene photographs because they've been printed all over the newspapers, and you know, they scream in in the in the airport. They just wail. And so I feel like the the way I wrote this was trying to work against that kind of true crime reportage, true crime writing, true crime um, coverage. So I actually don't mind if it's classified as true crime because it sort of sneaks the book into people's <laughs> hands who might be used to that other kind of reporting. Um, you know, I, I just feel like any classification that makes people interested in the work and want to spend time with it um, is, is fine with me, you know, and, and to, to, yeah, sort of in a subtle way, make sensitive reporting, um, appealing to true crime readers um, is great. Yeah. Yeah. It's hot in here <laughs> because of Hosanna. <laughs> Anyone else? You just drink wine. <laughs> Say hi to each other. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tiffany? Um, are there any other questions for the authors at this moment? Oh, awesome. Okay, one last one. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello. Maybe that's a good last question. I don't know. Uh, what are you up to next? Do you have uh. any new projects in mind? I'm working on a young adult novel about a Filipina American uh, queer kid who falls in love with her history teacher and gets into a lot of trouble. So. <laughs> 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 so, so that's gonna be for an American audience. So, yeah. um, so 
Um, I'm working on a novel in verse about nannies that radicalize the children they take care of. <laughs> it's based in New York. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, just so you know, we are selling books in the back. So come buy books for the authors and hang out. We have wine. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.